Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is my colleague, Carol Boudreau, Senior Fellow at the Mercatus Center here at George Mason University, Lead Researcher for Enterprise Africa, and a member of the Working Group on Property Rights at the UN's Commission on Legal Empowerment of the Poor. Carol, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you, Russ. I'm really pleased to be here. Carol, tell us, what is Enterprise Africa? Enterprise Africa is a research project that's just entering its third year. And the goal of our project is to investigate and analyze and really understand in some detail um, what seems to be working on the ground in Africa to alleviate poverty and promote some economic development. Um, We've looked at a series of different kinds of cases, um, some looking at individual entrepreneurs who've been able to succeed or not in Africa, try to understand why. Um, in some cases, though, we're looking at government policies that, in our um, in our characterization, create some space for entrepreneurship. Um, and then we're also trying to look at some examples of the private provision of social services. So three different categories of cases, um, and the idea is get a really good sense of what's going on on the ground in Africa. And I want to let the listeners know we're going to look at two or three of Carol's uh, studies and some of the results that you found. Uh, How many countries have you been to in Africa as part of this project? I've been to seven different countries, mostly in southern and east Africa. haven't been to West Africa yet. And if you count Mauritius, um, which is... I'd count it. Okay, so Mauritius as well. And who goes on these these case studies, these these research uh, trips? Who are are you going with? That's a good question. Um, Occasionally, I'm going with PhD students from the GMU Econ Department, um, but not always. Sometimes I'm going by myself to Africa and then partnering when we get to Africa with different people. We have two partners um, for this project. One is the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, and IEA's main role is, is in the publication and dissemination um, of the research. That's the main role they play. But our other partner who's been just unbelievably important for us in conducting this research is the Free Market Foundation of Southern Africa, um, which is headed by Leon Lowe, one of the great freedom fighters of South Africa. I just think it's such an extraordinary example of, uh, we would call what you're doing economic research, but what most economists do when they do economic research is they either sit in their armchair or if they get their hands dirty, as it's called, they are poring over government-produced data sources, usually American, if occasionally they would look at some foreign country data sources. But you're actually on the ground, which I think is just an extraordinarily good thing and really wonderful for our PhD students uh, when they're part of those projects to get uh, a flavor of what's going on in the real world. So uh, really, uh, it's unusual and a good thing. Um, And how has access been to the entrepreneurs that you want to talk to? Are people generally able to talk to you, willing to talk to you, excited to talk to you? Do they see this as a waste of their time? Um, What's their reaction when you approach them? Um, My experience is that it really matters, first of all, who your local partner is. Um, So whenever we've done studies in South Africa, having the folks at FMF work as the first person who goes in and makes contact has been a tremendous help because they have a great reputation in South Africa for um, all the good work that they've done fighting against apartheid restrictions and then subsequently fighting for economic freedom in South Africa. Um, If you go into a study and your local partner is not someone you know very well, then you can have a little bit more skepticism from interviewees. But I'd say generally my experience is is that people are delighted to talk to you. They are so enthusiastic to tell their stories. They're just so pleased that someone has come from a, a distance to try to understand their lives and the details of what they're doing. Um, so for me, doing that kind of qualitative research has been extremely um, 
extremely beneficial for me, but also just just very deeply satisfying because especially if you go back and interview someone more than once, you develop a relationship with that person and then you want to tell their stories. You want to communicate to the world what you've learned about this person and the problems they face. That's really neat. Uh, well, let's let's turn to the first uh, study, which is related to something we've been talking about a little bit here at Econ Talk a couple of weeks ago, which is coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, you did a uh, study of what's changed in the Rwandan uh, coffee industry and give our listeners a little bit of a thumbnail sketch as you do in your study of uh, recent history in Rwanda, uh, which is not so so pretty, and then what has changed uh, in recent years, at least for coffee growers. And I want to mention to listeners, we'll put links up to all of, of Carol's studies up on the website for you to, act, to read more about them if, you, if you're interested. So tell us about Rwanda. Sure. Rwanda is a very small landlocked country um, just south of the equator in Africa. It was a Belgian colony and had a rather difficult history as a Belgian colony because the Belgians had a strong, um, showed strong favoritism for one ethnic group in the country. And that was the Tutsis who are a minority of the population. Um, Do you so, know why they did that? Uh, well, people will, people yeah, say? people explain it in the following way, that the Tutsis um, probably um, probably migrated from somewhere in the Nile region. Uh, they're tall, thin, elegant people who are lighter skinned and who had been the rulers in Rwanda. And so the Europeans came in and saw that these people had the indicia of leadership. They were, they were, they looked more like the Europeans. They behaved more like the Europeans. They were the rulers. Um, so the Europeans tended to favor them. The other major group in Rwanda are the Hutus, um, who, this is a kind of a gross characterization, but tend to be shorter, darker, have been agriculturalists. The Tutsis were herders. There's a split all across Africa between herders and farmers, um, and that split plays out in Rwanda as well. Uh, during the during the Belgian colonization period, uh, Hutus had very little access to education, very little access to economic opportunity. Um, it wasn't quite like apartheid in South Africa, but there were some fairly significant um, disabilities that Hutus faced. Uh, the country got independent, got its independence from Belgium in six, 1960, 61, I believe, in the early 60s. And when that happened, the Hutus took over. Um, and Hutus were in charge, uh, ruling the country until the genocide in 1994. Um, the second Hutu govern government, which was led by a man named Juvenal Habyarimana, I didn't know this actually until I started doing work on Rwanda, has been labeled the most totalitarian government, the most totalitarian government that existed at that time, and this would be the 1970s, in the world outside of the Soviet sphere. So a very tightly controlled one-party state with the state exerting huge amounts of control over the economy. And the economy was uh, an agricultural economy. Today, it's largely an agricultural economy still. Um, so it was a country that had been first very much controlled by the Tutsi leadership, then very tightly controlled by the Belgians who, who imposed things like export control boards and required people to grow coffee. Um, but then the tight control continued under the Hutu regimes and was tightened even further under the Habyarimana regime. And that takes us up to the That'll take you 90s. all the way to the 90s. And what happened then? Um, in the early part of the – well, in 89, I think it's important to say coffee's always been the major export earner for Rwanda. Um, the, Bel the Belgians introduced the commercial growing of coffee, and, and that's how Rwanda has traditionally made most of its um, export revenue. Uh, in 1989, the International Coffee Agreement broke down, so the cartelization of the coffee trade was ended. Coffee prices tumbled pretty quickly. Um, so resources supporting that totalitarian government were contracting, were drying up. Uh, the government looked to foreign aid more as a way to support itself. At the same time, there was an invasion from Uganda of Tutsi rebels. The Tutsis, I should say also that there's been, a, there's been cyclical violence in Rwanda. The genocide was not the first episode of mass violence. 
1959, there had been mass killings of Tutsis, many of whom then left the country. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. and went to Uganda, went to neighboring countries. Uh -huh. In the early 90s, some of them came, some of them invaded the country. They were led by Paul Kagame, who's the current president. So the early 90s were a period of extreme instability in Rwanda. Coffee prices were plummeting. Farmers were losing money. The government was trying to stay in power, and they faced it, an invasion from the Tutsis. And what happened? Uh, and what happened was um, in March of 1994, spring of 1994, actually it might have been April, I may have my dates wrong, um, uh, Juvenal Habyarimana was taking off, the president of Rwanda the at the time, president. the Hutu president, was um, taking off from the Kigali airport and his plane was shot down. It was thought by Tutsi rebels um, this triggered the genocide episode, which was 100 days during which close to a million people were murdered. Not by the government. We usually think of genocides as being um, controlled, tightly controlled by the government. In this case, the government may have given people a lot of messages about why they should be fearful of Tutsis and why they should inflict violence on Tutsis, but it was neighbors killing neighbors. And the, these were Hutus killing Tutsis? These were Hutus killing Tutsis and killing moderate Hutus as well, anyone who had sympathized with Tutsis. And that ended when, roughly? That, that ended in the summer of 1994, at which time the the Rwandan Patriotic Front took control of the, which is led by Tutsis, took control of the government, um, took control of the capital, tried to calm things down, and basically that group has been in power ever since. And they have they did not respond by murdering Hutus. Uh, there has been a little bit of violence. Um, it's not that there was no violence, but there's been really nothing like the violence that preceded it. There wasn't retaliatory killings on any kind of large scale, roughly, which we might have expected. Yeah, um, uh, roughly a million Tutsis were killed. About and then yeah. but, and then the Tutsis took control of the central government of Rwanda in in ninety ninety four. Okay. Um, and subsequently, Kagame has been elected, so it's now a democratically elected government that he heads. How did he get elected if they're, a, they're still a minority, I assume? They are still a minority, and probably the, the major area of concern in Rwanda today is whether he's authoritarian, the level of authoritarian um, control, especially over the press. So opposition parties will say that... It, the elections were, they didn't have as much opportunity to um, talk to the populace about what they were offering. But, Kagame, but there are opposition groups. And Kagame has been in office since 94. He and he's, been. one of the things he's done is changed the rules of the game, the yep. incentives facing uh, coffee farmers. So tell us, which is the focus of the study. That's our background. So tell us what, what yeah, he did. Yeah, so this study looks at um, <clears throat> what happened in the coffee sector. The coffee sector had been very heavily controlled before 94. And what did that mean? It meant that farmers were required to grow coffee, subsistence farmers required to devote a particular percentage of their land to growing coffee. What does that mean? It means that there was a law that said a fourth of every every farm had to be devoted to growing of coffee trees, one quarter of your farm holding, one quarter of your plot. Regardless of prices. Regardless, regardless of, of prices, yep, and exactly. And was that enforced, do you think? Um, it's a hard it law seemed, to enforce. It seems to have been enforced, and it seems that enforcement was not so difficult because the government had agents – um, apparently posted across the country. It's a very highly populated country. It's a very small country, though. So people knew what their neighbors were doing, it seems, and there was a strong system of government informants. And it was a key source of government revenue. And it was the key source of government revenue. And they make sure we understand that the coffee crop – you're forced to grow it, but you didn't get to sell it, essentially. Well, you sold it to the government. Yeah, You okay. sold it to the government for a set price, which was always below the world market price. And then the government turned around, sold it on the world market. Exactly, and, and, and kept the difference. Okay. Right. Oh, it's a lovely bit of entrepreneurship <laughs> on the government's part. Um, perhaps not serving um, the interests of the farmers, though, uh, and probably going to a very small group of friends. Yeah. Okay. So that went wh – what period are we talking about that um, – Actually, let me stop. You say it's a small country and relatively crowded. Roughly how big is it? Can you give us a feel? Hmm. For some reason, I think the the analogy is that it's about the size of Maryland and may have 8 million people. Okay. So it's a pretty crowded country. Pretty crowded country. And this regime of forced growing and, mm -hmm. and government control of the export revenue – 
was from when to when, roughly? Oh, really, the the control started under the Belgians okay. and continued under the Hutu governments. And so if you're a farmer in that world, it's what you're used to. You, you, you right. grow part of your land. It's like a tax. Part of your yeah. land is devoted toward satisfying the, the tax man with the government collection of these um, this coffee for sale. Right. And in addition to that, they actually, the farmers also had to pay an export tax. So they had the implicit tax, maybe that's not what you would call it, but they had this tax of being forced to grow coffee, but then they also had to pl- pay a monetary tax in addition. Lovely. Okay. And the, the, and there surpri- are, I, what? <laughs> it's not surprising. There are a bunch of poor farmers. Yeah. And, and I assume they're a relatively large proportion of the workforce Huge in proportion. that activity. Well, they're still, it's still close to 90% of the population in Rwanda is are, engaged in agriculture. Okay. So when did this government control change and what replaced it? Changed in the late 1990s. Um, the Kagame government knew that it had a lot of debt to service, um, wanted to bring in more export revenue. People by the, by the early 90s were um, disregarding the law requiring them to grow coffee, and they were starting to pull up coffee trees in violation of the law because they were going hungry. There was actually a famine in the early 90s in Rwanda. Um, so the government wanted to give the coffee industry a real boost. I looked around, and Kagami is um, believed to be fairly friendly to markets. Uh, and he had some advice from international NGOs, including uh, Michael Porter's consulting group. And they suggested, you know, maybe you could do more with this coffee if you specialized, if you created a niche product. Don't just sell the old, don't just sell coffee the way you've always been selling it without really taking much, paying much attention to quality, but really have your farmers pay more attention to quality. Give them a little more freedom to determine if they want to grow or not grow and how they grow. And also allow them to enter directly into contracts with foreign buyers um, so they get feedback from the foreign buyers about what's valuable in terms of coffee and what's not. So the liberalization included getting rid of the requirement to plant coffee to begin with, allowing farmers to interplant coffee and other food crops. So, Which they discouraged before probably which was so they could keep before. an eye on yeah. where the coffee – section was on the farm. Exactly. Um, The government allowed people to enter into contracts directly, uh, and they um, revised the cooperative law so that people could, so it was easier for folks to join together into cooperatives. And this is important because in Rwanda, coffee isn't grown on plantations. It's grown by smallholders, people who may have a quarter or a half hectare of land and maybe 100 trees, maybe 200 trees. So if they can band together, they obviously benefit from some economies of scale in terms of marketing, um, some contracting, sharing costs, spreading risks. So trying to get an idea for what the Kagame government had in mind before, you had a very inefficient sector where basically the government was extracting what we'd call rents uh, from coffee makers, basically expropriating their, their crop, which gives them no incentive to do a particularly good job. It would presumably be better to uh, let them flourish and then tax tax them <laughs> vigorously and get a bigger share potentially from a larger, uh, a larger, much larger pie. Uh, so, is that what the goal was? Do you think on the Kagame government's yeah, part? Yeah, I do think that was. I do think that was the init- That was the goal. It remains an important goal. Uh, for the government. Um, I think that the coffee sector in Rwanda is pretty well recognized now as just a dramatic success story. Um, The government's liberalization program has really shifted incentives for coffee producers, and the results are are just almost almost astonishing. So what happened? So Rwanda is now producing... Sorry, when did this start, the liberalization? um, The liberalization started in 98, 99. About 10 years ago. About 10 years ago. Um, well, here's an example. In September, a lot of Rwandan coffee sold for $55 a kilo, which is about $25 a pound. Rwandan coffee 10 years ago was selling for 50 to 80 cents a pound. So, And what's happened to the world price of coffee over that time period? Do you know? um, the world price of coffee for specialty coffee has risen. The but world price for commodity coffee, which is what Rwanda had been growing, lower-grade commodity coffee, the kind of stuff that would be in Maxwell House, um, I think those prices have been falling over time. But basically, they got 
a, a 25 fold increase in per pound more than 25 more than fold. 25% uh, 25 times 25 greater. times more than 25 and times greater and part of that was a movement toward a different quality level towards a completely different quality level a focus on really taking very close care of every step of the production process and how about output output's not great rwanda's a small producer um, so the but is out- that up in the 10 years? Are they making um, more coffee or just different kinds of coffee? They're making different kinds of coffee. And there's a real push to increase the amount of coffee they're producing. Um, but two years ago, they had a bad a bad weather um, episode, and so the quantities were down. But their goal is increase the amount of washed coffee that's being produced. High-quality, specialty washed coffee coming out of Rwanda. How did they get their uh, reputation Established. How do they get yeah. the world to recognize that Rwanda? I mean, I think a lot of people think, oh, you just um, call it a Mercedes or just say it's really good or charge a really high price. But presumably they did more than that. They actually changed the quality, and but then they had to get the world to notice. So how did they do that? Yeah, that's a story that has a lot to do with um, something that we would usually be skeptical of, which is a foreign aid effort. Uh, the Rwandan um, got, the Rwandans were able to concentrate on increasing the quality of their coffee in part because U.S. aid, the U.S. the major U.S. development agency, uh, spent a bunch of money, about ten million dollars, supporting a project run by two economists, one out of Michigan State and one I guess he's an agronomist actually from Texas A and M. These two guys had been in Rwanda looking at how they could improve help improve the agricultural productivity in the country. Um, And almost by, in a way, not by design, sort of by serendipity, they started working on coffee around the same time that the liberalization happened. And they're the people who were instrumental in getting folks to join together into cooperatives and then taking, uh, teaching people how to grow coffee effectively and carefully, and then taking people literally to trade shows in the U.S., in Europe, in different parts of Africa, teaching their Rwandans how to cup their coffee and teaching them all about marketing so that buyers in the U.S. and Europe would know about Rwandan coffee. Because what did buyers know? All buyers knew was Rwandan, Rwanda produced a little bit of bad coffee. So you had to totally change the image and the brand of Rwandan coffee. And they've basically done that in 10 years. It's really remarkable. And what's been the impact on daily life for those farmers? For fa- for the farmers who are growing specialty coffee, there are some figures that suggest over uh, or about 50,000 uh, 50, families have seen their incomes double as a result of growing coffee. Um, the GDP per capita in Rwanda is about $250. So seeing your income double for very, fo- very poor families makes a difference in terms of things like being able to send your kids to school. People can pay school fees. They can buy shoes. They can put a corrugated tin roof over their home rather than having a thatched roof, um, which means that they're going to live in a drier, more comfortable home. Healthier home. Huh? Healthier yeah. home. It's amazing. Um, and what's the future going to – what's the future hold? Is it going to stay that way? Is it going to keep changing for the better, do we think? Future, I think, is pretty bright in Rwanda for coffee growers. Um, one of the – you know, this is an odd thing about markets. One of the ways in which I think Rwanda has benefited is that they were able to sell coffee with a story. So it's not just that you're buying good quality Rwandan coffee. You know when you're buying Rwandan coffee, you're helping people who had suffered from the genocide directly or indirectly. And you know in some cases that you're buying coffee that's grown on uh, hills where mountain gorillas live. So Rwanda sells coffee, but they add a story along with it. And the story, I think, is not going away anytime soon. I think people... Um, Mike Munger talked about the fact that when people buy fair trade, they think they're buying support for local local coffee producers. I think when many Americans especially buy Rwandan coffee, we like the idea that we're supporting people who've been through just a horrific experience and we're helping them rebuild their lives. Speaking of of Mike Munger, what's the – is there any fair trade coffee in Rwanda that you saw in your – Investigation. Yeah, research. there's definitely fair trade, and um, pe- how's that working for them? It works. Um, it, it, it works in an interesting kind of way. At first, when cooperatives are just entering the market, when they're newly formed, they like the idea of being able to buy the insurance that fair trade represents for them. 
um, because fair trade does guarantee them a particular price per pound for their coffee. Once they are certified to, um, once they're certified as fair trade producers, though, my experience interviewing people was that the fair trade certification very quickly becomes burdensome because there's a lot of re reporting requirements involved in it. Um, there are visits to the to the uh, cooperatives. Some of these people are not literate, and so keeping records can be challenging for them. They might actually have to go out and hire someone to come in and do this for them. But also the important thing is that at least for European people who are buying fair trade coffee from Europe, not the American fair trade purchasers, but the European purchasers, I was told, will not pay more than the fair trade price for coffee. So doesn't matter what the quality is of a particular coffee in Rwanda, if you're fair trade certified, you will not make more than the fair trade price for your coffee. So there's no incentive to produce there's, a higher quality coffee there. That's right. So what I found was that cooperatives who had the who had the ability to produce good quality coffee wanted to get out of their fair trade contracts and just sell their coffee on the specialty coffee market, which is a, which is a related but different market and doesn't have the kind of contractual obligations or reporting requirements that fair trade has. I think the bottom line for at least in Europe, if you're traveling in Europe, is to drink the high quality Rwandan coffee, help those those families there, and it's better coffee than the fair trade coffee. So, absolutely. So enjoy it. Enjoy it with a good conscience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about the cultural impact of these changes on quality of life on a day-to-day -day level for um, Rwandans, is there any – have these cooperatives uh, and any of the success of these entrepreneurial efforts that you're talking about help people lead uh, better lives beyond the financial side? Well, this is the interesting part of this study. Um, there is a fair amount of journalistic evidence now that people who are working together in the coffee cooperatives, and, and I'd assume this would apply also in some of the other agricultural cooperatives in Rwanda. They also have tea cooperatives and rice cooperatives. But that people who are working in the coffee cooperatives um, are, are reconciling that Hutus and Tutsis working side by side towards a common goal, which is create a successful cooperative, sell our product, make the most money we can in our cooperative, that these people are actually healing some of the wounds of the genocide. And again, this is journalistic evidence at this point, but we're going to go back in February to try to do um, an additional study to understand how does economic liberalization change incentives, behavioral incentives for folks. Right. So that's just, a, I think, a fascinating side, unexpected unintended consequence of economic liberalization. Yeah, we have an essay on the Library of Economics and Liberty website by uh, Sam Fleischacker on Adam Smith's view of these issues. And Smith argued that markets encourage you to be empathetic, sympathetic, uh, uh, that they enhance the virtues, contrary to sort of our standard American cultural view that, that money grubbing is dehumanizing. And it's um, – I hope it's true. That, I hope that, that's true too. that these folks sharing these goals and seeing that their prosperity is tied in with each other are actually maybe getting along better than they otherwise would. It's a nice yeah, story. I think it's a it's a different um, or it's a variety of the peace through trade literature, peace through trade yeah. literature, yeah. Um, and it's not peace through trade across borders. It's peace through trade within a particular geopolitical border. And what's so exciting to me about this part of the study is that I think it has really dramatic implications for post-conflict policies, for public policy. So imagine that you're in a situation where there's been a conflict, whether it's a civil war or mm, it could be an interstate conflict. In addition to the other things that people normally will do, policymakers will normally do to reconcile groups that are at odds, you might create a war crimes tribunal, you might um, create uh, truth and reconciliation commissions. Maybe one of the things you should be thinking about doing is liberalizing the economy, giving people opportunities to work together in ways that they didn't before. And this is the case in Rwanda, I'm going to suggest, that before under this tightly controlled um, political regime, people didn't had neither incentives nor opportunities to work together the way they do today. And that's making all the difference. That's really inspiring. Very nice. Um, is there any other liberalization going on in commodity markets in Rwanda outside of coffee? 
Yes, generally speaking, Rwanda has taken a very pro-market, um, pro-private sector approach to the economy. So they're liberalizing their tea sector, which is also a very important export revenue earner. Um, they're they're a little bit interested in clustering initiatives, What's which that? is pretty typical. Um, they they would like to, for instance, jumpstart an IT sector, create an mm. IT sector, and put lots of supporting IT businesses next to each other. Mm, kind of the uh, industrial park concept. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So there's some of that going on, but but there is a lot of liberalization going on, and that seems to be. Um, it, it's not a perfect country by any means, but that does seem to be having some good results. Okay, well, let's shift gears. Uh, that was fascinating. Let, let's look at a, uh, a different, totally different area you looked at geographically and institutionally, which is the Langa Township uh, in South Africa and the change in property rights and titling that took place there. So give us the background again for that story. What, what, uh, what was the pre- uh, liberalization regime, and then what, what changed? Langa Township is one of the oldest black townships in South Africa. It's located just outside of Cape Town, um, and it was created in 1918 during the Great Flu Influenza. The white city officials didn't want the black, the sick black people around them, so they forcibly evicted them and moved them to an empty field outside of town, which became Langa Township. Um, both under the, the pre-apartheid government and under the apartheid era government, uh, black South Africans and colored South Africans were subject to just a, a whole raft of legal restrictions. Um, it was very difficult for black people to move legally. Black people were not allowed to own property. Um, if they came into the cities, they were required to live in restricted areas where they had to rent property from city council officials. Uh, there were very limited economic opportunities in the townships. The idea was to direct the black people uh, to work for the white people in white areas and then carefully control their movements so that they could go home and live in their black townships. Um, and this is this is really the history of Longa. It's an area where people were would live, but there wasn't much economically formally anyway going on in the township. There were illegal and informal businesses. Um, but the government really forced people, if they wanted to be entrepreneurial in the townships, to be illegal or informal. And what was the property right situation there in terms of property rights, ownership? Rentals. Rental units completely. There was no ownership. There, there are uh, homes in Longa, small concrete homes, and there are hostels. Hostels are large dormitories where men would be sent um, or they'd be given space there, rental space, where they would live without their families. And the idea was the men would come to the cities and work. They would send money home to their families in the countryside, and while they were in the cities, they would live in hostels. So Longa's a mix of concrete houses and hostel housing, and then over time in the 60s and 70s, a lot of shack housing also was built in Longa. But there's very little commercial activity in the township. It's basically a, quote, residential community, but not much of a community in that it was a rental situation where ownership was by the government, is that correct? Right. The city government held title to the property in Longa. The Cape Town city government would hold title to properties, um, and it would enter into lease agreements with people, with black South black people who came to Longa to live. How many people live there roughly, do you know? Roughly. Um, about a half million, maybe. Wow. Okay. So we've got a half million people in, uh, again, in, in, a, in America, we'd call it a a bedroom community, right? It's a place where people just sleep and they go into the city to work. But here, uh, under rather horrifying conditions and very little chance of doing anything different than was done the day before, it sounds like. Right. Even if you wanted to do something like paint your house, you'd have to get permission. Paint the inside of the house you were renting. You'd need permission from the local authorities to do that. If you wanted to change a window, you'd need permission from the local authorities. The local authorities were supposed to maintain the properties, but Rarely did, because why Why maintain the properties of the black people? So this was a crumbling place. was a crumbling, place, depressing. Yeah, depressing, um, not a lot of economic activity. And no incentive to change. And so what did change in terms of the rules of the game, the institutional context in which these people were living? What, what happened? 
In the late 1980s, when it was clear that the apartheid era National Party government was was going to be losing power, um, the government undertook a series of reforms to try to give black people more economic voice. So, and, and in part, this was the result of the efforts of the Free Market Foundation in Southern Africa, who worked really hard to get rid of things like licensing requirements for black South Africans. Um, and who also tried to, who also argued effectively that black South Africans needed property rights if they were going to be um, full members of the of the South African society. So, uh, starting in the late 1980s through the early part of the 1990s, the government um, allowed black South Africans to take out long-term leases in properties. So, 99-year leases as opposed to year-by-year -year leases. And then eventually changed and allowed black South Africans to have freehold titles to the properties that they were occupying. And how did they set the prices for those when they sold the property to the to the people living there? Do you know? Yeah. Originally, the price was set at a sort of what would the market kind of market price. Um, and some people did buy at the market price, but there was no real market for property right. in yeah. townships. In fact, there's only recently. Um, people would only say only recently is there really a township property market, uh, but eventually so they picked the, a price. Though. They just picked it. They picked a price that they thought was right, and it's m my um, research suggests that price eventually just sort of went away. That titles were given to people. At first, there was a there was a requirement to pay, but by the after the transition in '94, when the ANC unity government took over, um, it it was more common for the government simply to transfer title if you could prove that you had lived in a property. And so you had ownership then of the of the property. Now, let's digress for a minute and talk a little bit about the ideas of Hernando de Soto, who argues in his book, The Mystery of Capital, that developing countries are incredibly handicapped by the fact that most people, the single most important, important asset they have is where they live, but often proving that they own that property, that just establishing literally the establishment of title is so poorly uh, either maintained or not allowed in this earlier regime that people have, one, no incentive to improve the capital that they either – they don't may not own it, but they're at least living in. And therefore, the funds that would normally be available in a modern economy to uh, finance investment – Entrepreneurship, new businesses, etc., is frozen in these in these properties. Uh, he calls it, I think, dead capital. Is that right? That's right. And so here was a change that where people had. Uh, it's a very nice natural experiment where people went from a world where they had no control over what where they lived to where they had the control and the potential to use that asset now because it's titled in their name as collateral for expanding and creating uh, new opportunity. So what what has happened uh, since the, the mid-90s in Longa Township as a result of this titling? I would say that the property in Longa was dead. It was dead capital just the way DeSoto describes it before the mid-1990s. It was also, people also had very insecure tenure. So at some point, maybe we can talk about why those two things are different. Talk about it now. Go ahead. Uh, tenure insecurity means that even though you may have rights to be in a place, you may have leasehold rights or you may have freehold rights to be on a particular piece of property, your ability to stay there s securely is limited. Um, so in South Africa, black people were being forced out of their homes or the government was destroying homes. They didn't have a lot of tenure security, and it could have been because of crime. It could have been because of government actions. When you have tenure insecurity, you're also not going to invest. Yeah, whether, you own, wouldn't, whether you own or not. Whether you own it or not. Yeah. So, the important, so tenure security is an important component of the DeSoto story, but only implicitly. He doesn't – I don't remember that he makes it very clear that tenure security is a vital part of this equation. So – in any case, before 94, tenure insecurity plus dead capital because you know, you, the black people weren't black people weren't allowed to sell and profit from um, this asset that they held, which was a house or use it as collateral. Yeah, definitely couldn't use it as collateral. Um, starting in the mid 1990s, well, starting earlier, they got they their tenure security increased because they had these long leases, and then they were given freehold title. Long leases that they presumed the government was more likely to respect. Absolutely, because that's not 
the lease itself, unfortunately, wouldn't be enough, right? Right. You have to be. You have to exist in a society where the government's going to respect the contract, and and the South African government has respected the contract. They have fairly secure tenure now. Um, so, I guess the short, the long and short of it is, the capital's kind of dormant, actually, in Longa Township now. People do invest. Once they got titles, you you definitely saw a shift in incentives in terms of a willingness to maintain and improve properties, but. There was not a single person I spoke with in Longo Township who used their house title to get a loan. Yeah, which is Nobody. interesting. I want to, <laughs> let's put that to the side. We, we'll come back to that. First, let's let's look at the what kind of improvements people did because I found that very interesting in, in the study. There's some nice pictures um, and then some of the uses they made, put that capital to once they improved it. So what were some of the improvements really that you saw? Typical improvements would be things like, um, remember this was housing stock that was crumbling because the, the National Party government had not done its job maintaining the housing. So when people finally got title to their houses, uh, they needed to replaster, they needed to put new roofs on, they needed to change windows. Many of them wanted to put decorative gates in front of their houses. The, all the sorts of things that you that we would do when we buy starter houses here in the U.S. You want to fix it up, you want to make it look nice because you're proud of it, because it's yours. And people definitely do that. And they, some of them, I assume, did do that and did that out of their own skill set. Uh, and so yep. others hired people. Is exactly. That correct? Some people are going to very carefully and incrementally, they're going to buy tile and they're going to lay the tile themselves. And and that's a very typical way to approach a home improvement problem in Africa. You're going to save money. And here. <laughs> and here too. You're going to save up a bit of money. You're going to buy the stuff that you need and you're going to fix the house. But other people are hiring local artisans. And this is another way in which the titling has spurred some economic growth. So carpenters, brick layers, tile layers, people in painters, local yeah. painters, all sorts of local people are now engaged in the home improvement business in Longa Township. In fact, when you drive through the township, you'll see all around you hand-painted signs, uh, get your cabinets here, or call me, I'm a plumber, and hand-painted phone numbers, probably to cell phones, actually. Uh -huh. So there, there is a business that's been um, really energized as a result of this legal change. But as you point out in the study, beyond just improving what they had, they put the houses to a more creative use sometimes. Absolutely. So tell us the story of Sheila. Uh, Sheila. Sheila is an entrepreneur, just a great entrepreneur in Longa Township. She had she had a very typical apartheid era story. She had worked as a domestic helper for some white people in Cape Town. And she tells the story of one day when she was working at their house, picking up a receipt and um, looking at the receipt, and the receipt was for two glasses of wine and a plate of cheese. And when she looked at the amount, the rand amount on the bill, she realized that that amount was more than she got paid per month. Um, so she thought, why should I... <laughs> What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this picture? This is not appropriate. And she decided she would go out on her own and find a job where she could make more than um, the value of two glasses of wine and a plate of cheese because she knew she was worth more than that. So she tried some businesses, um, selling used clothing, doing some food service. But after the change in after the change in Longa that gave people title to their home, she realized, you know what I think I could do? I think I could take advantage of something that's happening in South Africa. She was very entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially alert. She saw that buses were coming through Longa Township, buses of tourists who wanted to see what was the history of apartheid in South Africa. These buses would drive into the township. People would be sitting in them, white people, European visitors, American visitors would be sitting in these air-conditioned buses looking out the window at the township, but they would never get out because mm. the township might have been a scary place for these folks. And, and there she, wasn't anything particularly to do there. It wasn't a whole lot around, to do there, but like, yeah. you could walk around and sort of see what was township life like. But Sheila realized if I could get these people to get off the bus, I could serve them and I could benefit from this growing trade 
So she opened a restaurant with her daughter. She opened the restaurant in her house, though. Why did she open the restaurant in her house? Because there's virtually no commercial real estate in Longa Township. Because the old government never wanted there to be commercial activity in the township or very restricted commercial activity. There's one commercial strip in the township, and you have to rent space to get that commercial to get into that commercial strip. And having access to a lease is extremely difficult. So because uh, there had been some licensing requirements already re- already lifted in the past, Sheila was able to do something that we would have a really hard time in the U.S. doing. It would be impossible for me, even if I wanted to, to open a restaurant out of our home in Burke, Virginia. Couldn't do it. I'd be violating all sorts of laws. But Sheila has the economic freedom to open a restaurant, serving the tourist trade, serving traditional African food. You go in there, you go into her restaurant, she serves you, she makes a wonderful meal, all different sorts of meats, vegetables, desserts, and she tells you her story of growing up in the, in apartheid era South Africa. And she tells you her struggle and how she's made it using her property. Kind of like a living museum with a really good cafe, it sounds <laughs> like. Um, what has she done to her house to make it restaurant worthy? Is it She's By the way, in Cuba, it. in Cuba, there's there, there's an, it's another place where entrepreneurship is is quite restricted. And I understand that, that many people make some money by uh, running a restaurant out of their house, but here she's done some dramatic things to her house. Correct? She has. She's taken areas that were previously bedrooms and turned them into dining rooms. She's expanded the house. She's added a commercial kitchen onto the house. Um, she has made improvements in terms of lighting, in terms of heating, putting air conditioning in because the Americans especially don't like to go and and be uncomfortable. So she's made a whole series of incremental changes over about a 10-year period so that when you walk into her house now, you could never tell that this was the house she grew up in, and it is. It's the house that she grew up in, a small little house that's metamorphosed into a viable, successful commercial activity. So how many people can eat in the restaurant at a time? 60 people. 60 eat. people. 60, I and, think 60 to 70. And did you eat there? I did. I had a great lunch. It was wonderful. And she told you her story, presumably? And She did. <laughs> she was a little, she's one of the interviewees, one of the few interviewees who is a little hesitant about telling us her story. And this is, a, this is an important thing, actually, for anyone who's going to go do field work to know. Um, she's told her story before. And when she approached giving an, she approached giving an interview almost as a kind of trade, that there was an implicit trade going on. I'll give you information about me and my restaurant, but I would like something back. And what I would like to have back is I would like to see what you write. And no one had ever, no one who had interviewed her before had ever showed her the stories. So if you're, if you're any of your listeners are ever doing this kind of work, it's very important to keep track of your interviewees and send them copies of what you write when you're done. It's, it's courteous. It's, it's the, it's the civil thing to do, and people appreciate it. They want to see what they want to see what they're a part of. Well, equally important, I think, is to advertise her restaurant uh, here on yeah. international uh, podcasting. If if you're in. A Longa Township stopped by, and what the, what's the name? La Lapa is La the Lapa's. name of the restaurant. Okay, and uh, Sheila is a great hostess. So, is there a lot of these kind of restaurants being run? What what other businesses are being run out of people's homes, and? Um, how did she market that? How did she get people aware of – how did she get those tour buses to stop the first time? Do you know? I don't know how she got them to stop the first time, but her marketing is pretty much word of mouth and through blogging. So hmm. people who are going to Africa or going to Cape Town and want to go to an, an – I'm putting my fingers up to make quotation signs hmm. – want to go to an authentic African restaurant. Uh-huh. Uh, we'll talk about their experiences of going to La Lapa in Longa Township. So the internet has been, a, I think, a real boon for Sheila. Um, and she's in travel books, so she's gotten travel writers to come and visit the restaurant. And so what about other businesses? If you, if you wander around Longa Township, You'll see uh, if you got off that bus yeah. today, um, I assume 10 years ago you just saw shacks and, and these concrete dwellings. Now you see shacks and concrete dwellings with nicer gates and additions and a better roof and more paint, et cetera. But you also see these businesses. So you see... um, You're going to see barber shops. You're going to see um, spaza shops, which are small grocery stores run out of people's homes. 
You're going to see computers, computer repair stores. You're going to see internet cafes. You're going to see hardware stores. You're going to see butcheries, um, which is a place to go buy your meat if you need meat. Um, you're going to see tailors. You're going to see cleaners. You're going to see a whole world of economic activity in the township today. And you would have, it's not that you wouldn't have seen any economic activity before, but it would have been much more hidden because much of it would have been illegal. So all this, there's an expansion of economic activity, but Sheila, I think, and others like her to finance the improvements in their homes, which made no sense 20 and 15 years ago. Now they made sense, but what your study found, and this is the a little bit surprising and, and somewhat disappointing, they weren't using the property itself as the collateral to finance the investment in improving their lives, starting new businesses, as DeSoto might have hoped or thought. They were doing it out of small amounts of savings. Um, what is keeping people from using their homes as capital and preventing further expansion of economic activity? There's a whole variety of factors, um, some of which are unique to South Africa, but some of which aren't, that keep people, at least at this point, from using their titles as collateral. Uh, so in South Africa, there is a huge housing shortage. Uh, there has been a housing shortage for decades. So one thing people would say is that they won't use their title as collateral because if they can't make their payments and their house is, is repossessed by the bank, they have nowhere to go. They've got to go to a shack settlement, um, and they don't partic- or they've got to go live with a relative, and they don't want to do that. That's why, doesn't, why doesn't that just push up the price of the house to start with? Has it, I mean, is, are housing prices... Housing prices are rising in South Africa. Dramatically. Um, they have risen, especially in white areas, pretty dramatically, and they're starting to rise substantially in the townships as well now. So I, so that would be a little scary, obviously. It would be a little scary. So uh, there's that risk. I think the bigger problem, though, is that most black South Africans are working in the informal sector. They're not formal sector employees. And so if they wanted to go to a bank and get, get a mortgage, what's called a mortgage bond in South Africa, uh, the typical bank loan officer looks at them and says, well, no, we're not going to give you a loan because you're an informal sector worker, and that means your pay is erratic, and we don't know if you're going to have enough money in any given month to meet your mortgage bond. Um, so you don't qualify. You're a poor credit risk. There was a history in the early 1990s of banks doing some lending in townships, and when people would not be able to uh, meet their monthly payments, the banks would try to repossess, and the community would rise up and, and threaten the repossessors with physical harm. So social norms made it very difficult to actually repossess which at some point. Which discourage lending. Which would Probably discourage lending. Yeah. Um, but some other factors in South Africa and in any developing country would be things like Sheila's situation. Sheila doesn't want to go out and get a bank loan in part because if she were to have trouble paying back the loan, even though she has a good business, she would not only lose her home, she'd lose her business. Right, and her she'd livelihood. be out of work and her daughter would be out of work and five other people would be out of work. So for a variety of reasons, there's a lot of risk involved in using a home title as collateral in South Africa and in other developing countries. And other researchers have found have found similar things. So uh, Erica Field at Harvard has a nice study looking at what happened in Peru, DeSoto's home country, when people got titling. And her study is very similar to ours. She finds that people do make investments in improving the homes, but there's not a lot of use of commercial credit or not a lot of use of titles for purposes of raising commercial credit or accessing commercial credit. You also talk about some of the monopoly power that lawyers have over the process. Yeah. What, what's that? What, what's going on there? So what's going on in South Africa is that not only do you need lawyers to to formally transfer title from a buyer from a seller to a buyer, you need a specific kind of lawyer called a conveyancing attorney to formally transfer the title in the deeds registry. Well, the conveyancing attorney has a monopoly over this transfer um, this transaction. 
not surprisingly, charges a fairly significant fee to transfer properties, which imposes transactions costs on buyers and sellers. And so poorer folks who are buying homes, selling homes, they've gotten to the point where they don't even bother going to the conveyancing attorneys anymore. Um, They'll avoid those transactions costs, and they will informally transfer properties by writing out an affidavit, signing it, and having it witnessed at the police station. Well, this has no, you know, maybe this has a scrap of some kind of legal standing in a court, maybe a court would say, oh, well, the affidavit's better than nothing. But this is putting the deeds registry in South Africa completely out of date. So some countries that have that have embarked on titling projects spend a lot of money creating a deeds registry, the offices to record the deeds. But if people face significant transactions costs and they don't want to transfer formally, then that whole effort is wasted. And so what is the implication of that? That means that houses and other property uh, change hands less frequently than they otherwise would. What what else is important about that? Anything else? Well, I think it's important that you don't have information about who really owns – you don't have good information about who really is the owner of a piece of property. Another implication is that cities can't collect back taxes effectively from – or they can't collect taxes to support the provision of, you know, public services to the people in the townships. And this is a real problem in the townships. The municipal authorities – are very bad at providing electricity. They're very bad at providing garbage collection. They're not great at providing protection against crime either. In part, it could be because they're not able to collect the taxes from folks because they're not really sure who's living where. So what are the lessons uh, in, in from that study for making things better down the road? What, what, might, what might improve things? I think um, that the... S- I think one thing that I've learned is um, how little I know. Yeah. And so the titling, <laughs> yeah, it's a really humbling experience. Isn't it growing up, it's really yeah. frustrating growing up. <sighs> so there's this whole literature that ha- that exists about why we need to be careful about titling programs. And people who knew this land tenure literature and who read DeSoto in 2000 would have said, "Oh, be careful." go slowly. But maybe a lot of us weren't necessarily familiar with the land tenure literature. So we didn't know that Kenya had a, had tried a major land titling effort in the 1950s. That pretty much failed. And other African countries had tried major land titling programs in the 60s and 70s. That failed. So I think the lesson is titling is a is not a panacea to solve the problems of poverty. In some situations, maybe urban situations especially, it's it may be useful, but it's a very costly process, and there may be other intermediate steps that governments can take in order to give people more security in their property. So you don't need to jump from no security to full out freehold titling. That, I think there are going to be limited situations where that's going to be the appropriate policy strategy. Any lessons for the United States? Because uh, as you were talking about, you can't, you know, in the old days in South Africa, you, you couldn't paint your house, you couldn't repair a window. And I'm thinking, you know, in certain parts of America, you have to keep your garage door down uh, or you get cited uh, and have to pay a fine. I think that's in uh, Irvine, uh, California. I don't know if it's still true, but obviously if you want to add on to your um, house, you have to get permission in the United States. You have to get inspections. Uh, We have serious transactions costs for buying and selling a house. It's not a trivial thing that the the role of the government in establishing title, which is a gloriously effective thing in the United States – you almost never have a doubt as to whether you own your house or not. You know and can trust that you own your house. And yet the costs of that system are through for legal fees that you're talking about in South Africa are also uh, quite high. And then on top of that, we have zoning. We've talked to Richard Epstein about that in a podcast. And um, I've told the story of my, my son who was shocked that in America you can't uh, build something in your backyard and rent it out. It's your property, isn't it? So we have lots of property right restrictions in America. Have you thought at all, did anything cross your mind when you were in Longa Township about uh, American property rights? I think the, one of the lessons you could draw from the, the Longa study is how might inner cities in the U.S. change 
if the kinds of licensing restrictions that were removed in South Africa were removed here. Because even though a lot of the economic activity you see in the township is, um, is in formal sector activity, there's just a ton of activity going on there. And it's largely because people have the freedom to be a barber, to run a restaurant, to run a small internet cafe without having to jump through the hurdles, without having to jump through the hoops, jump over the hurdles or through the hoops that we have to jump over and through if we want to be entrepreneurial in the U.S. So whether the national party government intended it or not, probably I, I don't know the extent to which they did intend it, at least they created some economic freedom for the black citizens in the townships towards the end of their rule. And the ANC government has allowed that freedom to continue. And wouldn't that be great in some of our poorer areas if people had more of those kinds of freedoms and fewer barriers to face? Yeah, the, uh, the ultimate dead capital is human capital, the creativity of people to change their world around them and plan and create. And uh, it's, we should do all we can to make that easier. Yeah, I agree. Well, I, I wish we had more. We're out of time. I, it's been a great conversation, and Carol has lots of other uh, uh, findings that I hope we can come back to in a future podcast. Thank you very much, Russ. It was a pleasure. My guest today has been Carol Boudreau of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Thanks for joining us. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>